And so I slipped into a really tough time because I had dedicated my entire life to snowboarding and to going to the Olympics. When I was three years old, I actually told my parents I was going to the Olympics. So it was basically like my life revolved around a single goal for, you know, by, by that point, it was almost Welcome 20 years. To the On the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and uh, I'm excited to have another guest. And as you all know, we we find these really interesting and intriguing guests. Um, but before we get to today's guest, I really just want to lay down the, the premise of the show. The focus of Beyond the Ball is ultimately to focus on sharing stories, strategies, and successes to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And, and today uh, we're, we're bringing in a, a phenomenal guest, a young lady that that I was able to meet running around in these clubhouse streets. She was she was killing it. Uh, I saw what she was doing with with her podcast, which is entitled All In. And uh, with her podcast, this is something that, that she's really passionate about advocating for for athletes and mental health and women in sport. In addition to that, Natalie Allport is a former national team snowboarder, multi-sport athlete, speaker, creator, and lifelong entrepreneur. Let's go ahead and bring her out. Welcome to the Beyond the Ball podcast, Miss Natalie Allport. Natalie, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. Yeah, glad glad to have you. Glad to have you. So did I did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Help help me out. I know I didn't get it all. <laughs> no, you got everything. It's funny. I I think uh, whenever I try to write my bio, I was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of things that I'm that I'm up to. So I I think you hit on all of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, you know, the the other aspect, like we were talking about offline, is just you know, you just killing it on on TikTok. Okay, you just. You just <laughs> Just you, you, you do you do such a great job, okay, Natalie. You do a great job, so I want to give you those flowers. And just like looking at the level of production, even though I'm assuming you do it with your phone, so I, I didn't plan on starting off this way. But Natalie, if there was somebody out there who just wanted to like get started on TikTok, they're just starting an account. Like, what, what what's like three tips? You can be like, just three tips to try. Like, like talk to us, please. Yes, uh, create as much as possible. I think at the start, like just throwing things out there and seeing what works. That's the best way. I think that's a little bit different than other platforms. For example, Instagram is a little bit more polished. So you care a little bit more about, you know, how you present yourself from the get go. But the way TikTok works and you don't know which videos are going to take off. If you have like multiple sides to what you do, like perhaps you're only into fitness. Well, that's, you know, easy for you. You're like, okay, that's all I can focus on. But if you have all these different areas, see what sticks, like put these things out there and see what sticks. Once things start sticking, try to recreate that as much as possible. I think the other tip is um, to spend a ton of time on the platform originally. Like now I don't spend that much time like scrolling through my TikTok feed, but at the start I really did just to get a nuance of like how things are working and how it works different than other platforms and what's taking off, um, what kind of content is performing well, what kind of content is performing well for other athletes, um, for other creators in, in my niche. So uh, I think, you know, spend a lot of time, put what works out there or just test out what works first and then recreate some of those things that are working once they start working. Very nice. I, I, I love that. Thank you for giving us that quick little TikTok masterclass. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with you being the fir first of all, you're, you're the first snowboarder that, that we've had on here. You're the first winter sport athlete that we've had on the platform. I, I feel that I, I hope I'm not boxing you in, but I'm just, you know, association. Um, yeah. So how do you get into how do you get into snowboarding? Talk, talk, talk to me. Talk to me. Yeah, you know, where I live, so obviously Canada is like a big winter sport nation and essentially, but where I live, there's not big mountains. So even within Canada, people are like, really? Like from Ottawa, you you got into snowboarding? And I think actually I have heard this stat thrown around that per capita, my like city has the most, uh, I think, skiers in, in Canada, which might be true purely based on where the nation's capital. So there is a lot of people, not as big as like um, a Toronto that people might have heard of or a Montreal. But uh, we do have a lot of local small ski hills. And so I do think we have a lot of outdoorsy people here who are just interested in all those types of sports. So I actually, I was born on the West Coast, which is 
a big, you know, ski area because there's a lot of the bigger mountains. So I learned how to ski when I was like two years old. And then we moved east and uh, got a little bit into skateboarding and then saw all the cool kids in my in my school were into snowboarding. And I was like, I, I want to be cool. So <laughs> I traded in my rental skis one day when I was like off with my parents for, um, you know, a day of skiing with the family. And I said, I'm going to try snowboarding and then just uh, never look back. I wasn't good at the start, but I just committed to it and wanted to learn and just thought it was so cool. So in, so in, in, in comparison, snowboarding and skiing. Talk, talk to me talk, because I mean, I, I haven't done either. I was supposed to go on a I was supposed to go on a ski trip and then I ended up canceling. But the, but the differences, the variation, j just talk to me since you've done both. H help me help me understand a little bit. Yes. OK, so skiing is the not cool one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's there's a war between them. My brother skis. Um, <laughs> but there is actually kind of like some animosity between them but um once you get to the higher levels like i mean at competitions for example all the skiers are friends mm -hmm. with snowboarders but at the local hill people always jab and um, make uh -huh. fun of you know if you ski or if you snowboard but snowboarding was kind of the sport that brought freestyle into into the light like back in the day ski racing was kind of like the big thing and it still is really big um, and then snowboarding was like the rebellious sport. So it pretty much stemmed from like surfers wanting to go on the slopes and not conform to this like strict ski culture. Um, mm. And so actually originally, I think when snowboarding was first getting started, all the ski hills in North America, and I think definitely in the States, they like ban snowboarding. Um, so snowboarders would like sneak up onto the mountain and like all the older skiers would get really annoyed. So snowboarding really started, started as a rebellion and then it kind of grew in popularity. And of course, you know, money talks. So as it grew in popularity, the ski hills were like, okay, well, we have to let these people in because they're spending a lot of money. Um, and so they opened it up and, and then snowboarding just became kind of like this freestyle sport. Everyone wants to hit the jumps and everything. And there is, uh, also select snowboard racing too, but that actually opened up a whole world for skiing. And now you see in the Olympics, like big air skiing, half pipe, uh, slope style, like all the jumps and all the rails. So people are doing the same things on skis as a snowboard. So um, the worlds have kind of meshed together, but that's why there is that history of kind of conflict between them because skiing is the much older sport, the more traditional sport. Uh, you probably watch movies from kind of like the 19, I don't know, 80s or something, you see that like rich family that goes skiing. Um, but that's basically what snowboarders were fighting against because they were all like skateboard and snow and surf kids who just wanted to go down the same way they could uh, on the concrete or on the water, but on snow. Mm, wow, man, I'm getting all the education lessons today. This, this is <laughs> awesome, man. This is awesome. If you all have not, make sure that you all definitely connect with connect with Natalie on, on Instagram, connect with her on TikTok because she she is a wealth of knowledge, like what wealth of knowledge. And and, and I, I want to take a slight pivot here, um, Natalie, and I, I want I want to hear more about your story and then how ultimately from like you in in the role of an athlete and I, I know you're still very much so athletic because you make me feel so bad about myself and I see you. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? But but just talk talk a little bit more ab about your journey and then your transition, like from sport and then to like where you are now with, with what you're doing with your business and, and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll do the, the quick notes version, but basically I grew up, you know, playing every sport. Um, I actually, you know, probably talking about snowboarding people might think um, it's such an alternative and action sport, but I grew up kind of from a very traditional sport background. Uh, hockey was my main one. And mm. so I was really into that in, in like in elementary school and in high school, I basically played on every sports team possible. In elementary school, that was possible. But then in <laughs> high school, you have to pick like per season. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I would try to do track. I tried to do cross country, volleyball. I, in elementary school, I did some basketball, some soccer, um, different things, but then obviously landed on snowboarding and basically had to give up uh, hockey entirely. And so it went all in on snowboarding. I became a snowboard instructor. So that can convince my parents to drive me to the hill because I would say, hey, I have a job. Like, that's why you got to <laughs> drive me. Um, so that was great. And then once I started doing some competitions in my last year of high school, I ended up graduating high school semester early so that I could, again, go all in on snowboarding. That summer, snowboarding was announced into the Winter Olympics for 2014. And this was 2011 at the time. 
And so that opened the doors to having a national team. At the time, basically the top competition that I would have been able to compete at would have been like X Games, which is still super popular. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no Olympic event for my sport of slope style snowboarding, which is like all the jumps and the rails and one run. It's a, a judged event. Um, so you're doing like a bunch of tricks, spins, flips, slides on rails and th stuff like that. Oh. And so, yeah, so then I ended up getting into the junior national team, just basically based on the, the results I had that spring, which I had no idea at the time would kind of lead mm -hmm. to this, this national team program. And I ended up spending four years with the national team program, unfortunately fell short of the 2014 Olympics. Ultimately, 2018 was kind of my uh, objective based on just my timeline. Like I was young, 2014 would have been a bonus. So I was upset I didn't make it, but not, you know, like devastated. But then I kind of went through a whole slew of injuries. I had some mental health, different things, and I ended up deciding to step away from the sport in 2015. So just a year later after that, not making a run for the 2018 Olympics. Um, stepped away, I got into the sport of CrossFit, which is all the videos that, that you mm -hmm. see now. Um, been dealing with a shoulder injury for the past two years, really. So I haven't been doing uh, uh, competing as much in that lately, but hoping to make maybe some sort of comeback we'll see over the next year or two. Um, and yeah, transitioned into entrepreneurship, into business, and um, really been over the last couple years into like creating and speaking on my story because um, probably like many former athletes know, like when you are going through that, that transition and it's tough, it's hard to speak about it at the time. Um, and so now I feel like I've kind of healed enough. Uh, I think the healing never ends, but um, that I can speak on it. Yeah, yeah, man. Wow. So I, I, I can't help it but think as you were just talking about like what you've done just in regard to snowboarding and, you know, how you're doing the trips and the, 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 the tricks and the flips, the tricks and the flips. Yikes. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I used to love this game called SSX. Yes. Oh my too. gosh. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. I loved it where you do all the flips and you go upside down and do all that cool stuff. So that was going through my head. I was just imagining you as the character in the game. But isn't just, SSX so crazy? I think in the game you can like take off the snowboard and like use it as a guitar and then put it back on your feet. Like there's all these crazy things that obviously would not be humanly possible. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was so, so much crazy stuff going on, but then just, I mean, hearing hearing your story, I think it's I think it's cool to be able to connect it to a real life person, like you know, just the the, the overall premise of it. But but you just just sharing what you really hit on about um, just the aspect of like like mental health. Why are you so passionate about mental health, and ultimately why why do you advocate so much around around the push for mental health? Talk talk to us. Yeah. Yeah. So when I stepped away from snowboarding, like that decision had so many different facets involved. One, I had a slew of injuries, which uh, I feel like safe saying that I was probably the fittest female snowboarder on the world tour, just based on the fact like a lot of people weren't into training or they were a lot lighter. And I was like really strong like because I trained already starting to do CrossFit. I was um, you know, squatting really heavy at the time and doing different things because I just really enjoyed the gym. I had a passion for it. But despite that, like snowboarding isn't one of those sports where it's like you work super hard in the gym. It's all going to pay off on the court or on the field. Some people learn tricks faster. Uh, it's a judge sport, obviously. And then there's just freak accidents. Like the mm -hmm. wind comes up and you get too much speed for a jump. And all of a sudden you land 100 feet down the landing instead of like where you were supposed to. Wow. Um, so a lot of different things that, that play into it. So I had kind of a slew of injuries. Like, for example, I was injured in the lead up to the 2014, um, like Olympic qualifying events. So I ended up only being able to do one event. So I would have had to win that event against the people who ultimately went on to win the Olympics to even be able to qualify for the Olympics. So it was definitely a, you know, a tough run up to even trying to qualify in 2014. And, um, just as I went on, I started noticing just in myself journaling and figuring out like just questioning if this is the right sport for me. Do I still love it? Do I still want to continue? And then seeing a lot of friends near me get like much worse injuries than I ever got, like in the hospital with their parents beside them, they're, you know, coughing up blood and things like this. That is like just horrible injuries. And I remember my coaches sat me down and they said, you know, you have a really good chance 2018. We need to make a game plan. Like how is this next quad of training going to go? And they just told me, they're like, but you've never had a major injury. It's not an if, it's just a when. And just plan in that four years, like there could be a year or two years that you're off because of some bad injury. And um, I, you know, I've broken my ribs, I've got concussions, I've broken my tailbone. Somehow those are not even like considered on the radar of bad. Like, you know, there's ACL tears are, you know, a dime a dozen. There's 
um, internal bleeding injuries, like life-threatening injuries. I never had any of those. And so I started really just feeling scared and just worrying about like, what could this do to my family if I injured myself? Um, and at the same time of all those things going on, I was starting to get anxiety attacks in the off season and um, dealing with homesickness, which is something I never thought I would get because I was living this life that like my 13 year old self was dreaming of. Um, but then I would be at these mountains and just wishing I was at home. And so I was going through all these things mentally and it was just really tough. And eventually I decided, okay, I'm feeling like maybe I need to step away. So I still went all in on my last season just to make sure, you know, it was the right decision and stepping away. And all of a sudden, all these things I hadn't dealt with, that anxiety and these anxiety attacks that I had no idea why they were happening, they just started happening like daily. And everything just kind of caught up. And I started, you know, I didn't know why I really wanted to quit. I told my coaches, oh, it's injuries or this or whatever. But ultimately, it was really just what I was going through mentally with fear, with mental health. Um, and so I slipped into a really tough time because I had dedicated my entire life to snowboarding and to going to the Olympics. When I was three years old, I actually told my parents I was going to the Olympics. So it was basically like my life revolved around a single goal for, you know, by, by that point, it was almost 20 years. And so then I ended up, yeah, ended up just going through a really tough time, getting diagnosed with depression and anxiety and going to therapy and working through all those things. And it just, for me, someone who on the outside looks super happy-go-lucky, even at that time, I was spending six hours a day at the gym and everyone thought I was super positive. Um, and just growing up as such a positive, passionate, motivated, energetic kid, and then seeing how low I could go um, was just really scary. Cause I was like, this is not me. And if I'm usually like at this level of energy and positivity and I can go this far, far down, imagine people who didn't start off with that level of energy and positivity. And so as I worked through those things, it took a long time still, you know, I still have to always be proactive with meditation and different things to manage my anxiety, but I've been able to kind of pull myself out of that depression for sure. And just see a whole new outlook on life that was completely different than what I thought at that time. Like at that time I had supportive family. I had, um, you know, I already had my business started. I had things going for me still. I had, you know, this new sport I was doing, but yet I saw absolutely no future for myself. I saw like there was nothing. I was like, if without snowboarding, what am I? Like I failed. People will, you know, laugh at me because I never made it or whatever it was. And, um, and so now I just, I realize that other athletes have gone through the same thing. Other athletes will go through the same thing and, um, and are going through the same thing. And so if now I'm in a place where I can reflectively speak about it and offer, you know, guidance on what, what helped me or just at least open up the conversation to break the stigma, I feel like that's kind of my responsibility now, just based off what I've learned through it. Yeah. So if there is, if there is somebody out there and you know, they, they, they might be in a, in an area where they might be in a, a quote unquote funk or, you know, they're they're outside of their their norm. And, you know, they hear this conversation about mental health. They hear this conversation uh, about therapy and different things like that. Like what, what's just something that, that you would suggest for somebody like a word of a word of wisdom or a tip um, that, that you would give to somebody who might be in that position? Yeah, I mean, two things. One is like talk to someone about it like that. Just talk to someone that's always going to to help and know that you don't have to go through it alone. It doesn't have to be, you know, therapy. It doesn't have to be uh, a parent if maybe those people aren't your support system. But just if there's someone, anyone that you can talk to or just resonate with someone else's story that you see out there that's similar, um, that really, really does help. And then the second thing is just keep believing things will get better because there's a point where I just never, you know, I definitely, the thoughts were like, this will never get better. Like nothing in my life will ever be better than the things I did snowboarding. So what's, you know, the point, but if you just keep believing that and just like sort of pull you out of those darkest, darkest days, even though you don't see it um, and just take my story, for example, or anyone else's story, who's been able to pull themselves out of there. Just know if you keep every day, every day, it might take a year, it might take two years, but things will get better and your, your mindset will change. Yeah. I think, I think that's really powerful because I think so often we can lose sight if we're not careful of how strong our brain really is to where if we, and I'm not really big on, you know, you believe it, you manifest it. Like, and I mean, you know, there's all these different thoughts and affirmations and all these things, but there come, there does come a point to where if you believe that I have to make this amount of money in order for me to go on this trip, 
and then when you have the belief and then you take the action that follows then i believe you can produce that result or get to that goal but if we forget about that just like what you're saying then then you eliminate yourself before you even make the attempt yeah exactly that like if we can go from being positive at one point to all of a sudden thinking this negative we have to believe that we can change it but it, it does take time it's like mm -hmm. it's like when you find yourself you've put on i don't know 40 pounds and you're like oh my gosh i need to lose it it's not going to happen overnight and you might not see results like right away right but if every day mm -hmm. you keep showing up despite you know how you feel eventually over time something is going to change certainly and i have to say this because i'm currently reading atomic habits you know it's just that thing oh, yeah. just little yeah. by little you know that that one percent increase that one percent increase would definitely help you know ultimately make a big change long term but get, getting the habit yeah get, getting getting the habit getting the habit yeah so natalie i i told you earlier that you know you're killing it on TikTok. then i'm not sure if i saw you first on clubhouse or i saw you on instagram on instagram or linkedin but I, like i noticed like the branding for your podcast and then i went on your instagram and i'm like man she's killing this branding stuff <laughs> so so just just, just talk, talk to me a little bit about personal branding and talk talk to me a little bit about what, what you have going on with, with your market agency yeah oh i think like branding especially for athletes former athletes or anyone really it's just so important um i am not like an artist by any means when it comes to like creating. But now in this digital age, I do feel like like a creative and like a creator because I've been able to produce things on TikTok. I've been able to, um, you know, create my own brand and do a little bit of design or guide design or videos and different things. So for me, it's fun. I love like that aspect of branding, but I also just think it's so important. Um, like my marketing agency stemmed from, uh, I you know, I went to, to business school. I did it all online while I was, doing my, um, while I was traveling the world snowboarding, basically, just crushing <laughs> the online school. So anyone who's going through that, like, online school right now, I feel you. <laughs> I did uh, my four year degree all online. So oh, I, I, wow. Oh, yes. Four years? Yes. Well, it actually probably took me whew, like, seven years, because like, I just could do things when I was injured or like on yeah. my own time outside of snowboarding. Okay. Um, yeah, I was never in one place long enough to actually go to, to wow. school normally. It's also not encouraged when you're on the national team. You're kind of supposed to just delay that until life after. Um, uh, but I thought, you know, if I spend all my 20s, you know, snowboarding, I don't want to go to school like when I'm like in my 30s. So it was also agreement with my parents. <laughs> so <laughs> I did both at the same time. It was a compromise. Um, but yeah, it, it stemmed from me having to learn how to market myself in sports. And I just saw the results and how powerful it was. I was able to get sponsorships that my competitors or my teammates who might have been at a better or higher level or had better results weren't able to just from what I was able to learn from marketing. I also kind of been like an entrepreneur since I was a kid. I was like that kid selling things at school. My family and I had a, we started our first business when I was 10. So we did like a lot of different things. And I just knew marketing was my passion, marketing and, and branding and, and those things. And obviously it's transferred into the social media world that we, we live in now. So just think it's, it's just so important. And so I'm glad that you, uh, you noticed because I do put a lot of effort into uh, just my own personal brand. And I hope that it speaks for kind of my, my agency and um, that I know my stuff because I try to implement it on my own stuff. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I mean, I can tell you, 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 you eat your own cooking is, is the phrase that, that I always hear referred to. But I mean, even, even just thinking about that and just thinking about um, branding and, just the, the time that we're in right now, I, I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on, and these are about to be two total different polar opposite things, but NFTs and name, image, and likeness. Yes. Let's let's start with NFTs because that's okay. what I know less about. So I'll okay. disclaimer, okay. like I am no expert <laughs> on NFTs. So if anyone's listening, do not make any investment decisions <laughs> based on anything I say. But um, so I grew up like not playing any video games. My parents other than like SSX was like a friend had it. And so mm -hmm. we would go to that friend's house and try to play it. But of course. Um, but yeah, we had, we didn't really watch TV or play video games. So it is mind blowing to me to think that people put that much value on something in a virtual world. But I, I, I do understand it, like from a marketing perspective of like understanding psychology and trying to put my head into someone else's. I'm like, okay, I could see how for someone who does value this, it is important. Like I've seen someone who I think in an F1 game, they bought like a piece of the track for like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands or something. Wow. And I was like, I could see that because in real life, you could not go to the track and buy a piece unless you're like a major mm -hmm. corporation and sponsoring the the track or something. So it is interesting. 
But um, yeah, I think that like marketing and branding and the just the creator uh, economy, I think is going to take off. And NFTs is like a way to monetize. I think right now, you know, we're seeing the big time athletes, Gronk, uh, people from different sports, really, who mm -hmm. are coming on and they're making an NFT, minting an NFT and selling it for quite a bit. Like we've seen, I think Mahomes NFTs went, you know, he made over 3 million, I think. Yeah. Um, there's a few other players who have made millions or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but we aren't necessarily seeing like, for example, Natalie Allport, like making an NFT, how many of people who actually follow me even own Ethereum to be able to pay or understand mm -hmm. it enough to go on, right? So I think we're seeing some of those those big names pay off as they built their audience and their personal brand for so long over time. This is a chance for them to directly go to the fans and um, kind of, you know, just make a, a sale there. Um, and create some sort of economy around that. But I think similar to Instagram, when Instagram first started, we everyone followed like the Miley Cyrus, the um, these superstars, right? But now uh -huh. Instagram has created its own superstars. So I do see NFTs the same way where it's like right now we got, like, like I said, like the Mahomes coming in there and monetizing his brand with $3 million sales. But now what about the artists who start on NFTs with zero audience? Could they build their mm -hmm. NFTs over time? I think as those people bring in their fans to the platform, those people will be more inclined to look at what else is out there in the digital art world. Because people who follow me, I'm probably not going to be their first gateway to NFTs because they're like not that inclined to go through the process of spending days setting up a digital wallet getting Ethereum, getting all these things, but they are willing for those big stars. And once they're on there, they can buy other things. Oh. So that's my thoughts on NFTs, but it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. I think people are also riding the wave in a sense where we'll see things stabilize. Like people are like, oh, we all got to jump in. Let's all buy NBA top shot and all this, but um, it can only go up so much before, you know, there's more supply than demand. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, yeah, and, and, and do, you, oh, what, do you have any thoughts on NFTs before we go to NIL? Well, the only, the, only, the only reason I asked was because I was on Twitter the other day and I saw somebody sold like a graph of their skin. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, what? And, and I mean, it, it went for $5,000. But of course, I've been hearing, of course, like the Mahomes and the $100,000. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing these bigger numbers. So when I heard that for five, I was like, was it, was it worth it? Did it make sense? So, you know, but I... Just in regards to NFTs, I'm just waiting for it to fizzle out. Just kind of like the same thing with, I, I don't think Clubhouse is necessarily going to mm. fizzle out. I think Clubhouse is here for a while, but I think the NFTs will more so fizzle out because I don't see everybody hopping onto it because it is digital. And then just like you said as well, it's one of those things to where as as, as there is a buzz and every, people are riding the wave now, it's going to eventually level out. So. That's yeah, nice. it's like NBA Top Shot. So I haven't bought an NBA Top Shot, but I get their emails, which is very frequent. Um, and uh, I guess how they've made it is it almost from from the user perspective, the UX side, is like you put in your credit card. And so it doesn't feel like you're working with like a crypto. So for the end user, it's super easy to get into because you just like put your credit card, make a purchase versus mm -hmm. like when you actually get into some of these things like Mahomes sold or Gronk, I'm like, I think you have to have a digital wallet. You have to have Ethereum. Like, and that's not something that like a 17 year old kid is doing. Most 17 year old uh, kids are doing yeah, or <laughs> yeah. Or like just the normal person, like just walking around who has a normal nine to five, isn't like thinking all day about crypto. Like it's still mm -hmm. just a small percentage of the population who even have the access to be able to buy some of these things. So that, uh, so yeah, it's, it's hard to say because I think NBA top shot, like I think the company just got valued at like some crazy amount, like billions that, that started it. Um, but I think they've done a really good job because it almost looks like it's not crypto, but it, it is. Mm. Um, so it's an easy transaction, but mm. that takes obviously a huge, like a company to make a huge investment into it versus like a creator making just something themselves. So if, if there is like a platform that gets started where a creator can just make something themselves very easily, and then it's seamless for the other person to feel like they're not using crypto. They don't have to like go and get Ethereum or go get Bitcoin, put it to Ethereum or whatever the transfer is. Then that could have opportunities to take off. Cause I, I could see like you invest in sports cards and you don't want to actually physically be holding it and shipping it to other people and playing in that game. If you could just do it digitally, that, that can make sense or sell memories. Or I saw Tony Hawk the other day, he was going to make an NFT of an old video he found of one of his um, 
540s that he did that no one has oh, ever wow. seen. And I was like, actually, that would be pretty cool to to own. So I, I could see some possibilities, but it's, I think for them to really like, they're riding the wave now of the people who are in it, but for it to keep going longevity wise, I think they do have to make it a more seamless process like NBA Top Shot has been able to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, man. Okay. I was, I was pretty, I was pretty good. You helped, you helped me because I, I didn't know about as much as what you just shared. So thanks. That well, no problem. I've been doing some research. I've been trying to like dig into NFTs and I spoke on a panel a couple of weeks ago about NFTs with some uh, like including Patrick Mahomes agent was on there and it was the day after he sold uh, all those. So like I spoke on the oh, first wow. part, which was about mostly about like athlete empowerment. And then I just listened to all the things about NFT and soaked up the information. <laughs> Well played. Well played. That, that's that's how you do the panels for sure. That's how you do them. You know, you add your value and then you, you take good notes. Take good notes. Oh, yeah. So now 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 we, we, we got to hit it. We, we got to hit it now. I'm going to get ready to let you go here in a second. But we, we got to talk about it. This this name, image and likeness thing with, yeah. with, 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 with you being an athlete who has been sponsored, you know, with you being an athlete who I mean, I'm sure you probably still got some sponsorship type stuff. So to, so just name name, image and like I, I just want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think super important for college athletes. I think what's been happening for college athletes not being able to profit off their name, image, and likeness is just really upsetting because, like, how can they not even at the very least, like, offer coaching services, for example, or start their own co coaching business? When I was, I, I trained uh, local ski and snowboard teams at one point based off, you know, I'm a national team athlete, I into strength and conditioning. What, why can't college athletes do the same thing? I think especially for female athletes, those could be four of the highest earning years of their lives if they don't have a pro sport option to go to. Because a lot of sports, we female uh, uh, women's sports don't have that pro option. Like there's soccer, limited teams, there's basketball, limited uh, income. It, the WNBA probably doesn't get necessarily as many eyes sometimes as some of these college women's games. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a lot of sports like hockey, for example, that you, you have to pay for your own equipment in these pro leagues. So they're they're not really getting paid anything. So imagine when you have these eyeballs on you and you're making all this money for the school, how come you can't even at least offer like some sort of coaching or do some side of side hustle or just get sponsorships from your Instagram following? It's it, it still it just it blows my mind. So I think it's a good thing. Um, for athletes, I also think because of, of this day and age, some athletes don't want to go to school. They can hop straight into entrepreneurship. They have other options of what they can do. Um, or they, you know, like the route I did, which is take online school while I was competing. And so the, right now, the traditional route is they have to go through like D1 if they want to then go pro and, and all these things. But what if you know, they're, they're valuing that free education less in a sense. It's like, you know, people make the argument, you're getting a free year of edu or free years of education. What if the, they don't want to go to school in the first place? So they wanted to, they had an option to start a business or, mm. or they went to online school or something different that year or those years of school are getting devalued in the athlete's mind. And so I think there needs to be more on the table. Um, and so, you know, as someone who had to learn how to get sponsors and things at 17, I think obviously there's some downsides, like things are going to have to figure out, not get taken advantage by agents and all these things. But I think it's figure outable. Like, I think they can do it with help of parents, just good guidance, good coaches. Um, I, I think it's going to be a, a good thing in, in the long run. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Natalie, I appreciate your perspective so much because you like stretching my mind today because I didn't know. Like, I mean, I knew women's NBA that there was limited teams, but uh, just some of the other information that you just shared, I wasn't I wasn't really, really privy to just in regards to um, about how some individuals that there, there is no pro there is no pro level for for the uh, women or for the female athletes. And don't and just everything you shared. It just prompted me to this other question. What what can we do on the other side? Like, uh, you know, just just ultimately in collaboration, what, what can we do as a people to help further women in sport? I think we have to, like, for example, showing our kids, male or female, amazing female athletes and having them as role models. For example, like we have amazing new media platforms that are highlighting and focusing on women in sport. And that's great. But think about the platforms with massive reach, like Sports Center, Barstool, like these ones. The way they portray women is, uh, I mean, they're getting better. But like, for example, Barstool for the longest time would post like pro male athletes, funny videos, and then videos of like girls having drinking fails or like just like 
silly videos. And I was like, that doesn't help the narrative. It makes men just instinctively when they see that look at like male athletes as strong and capable and female athletes or women in general as like failing or just drinking or whatever it is. Um, and I, so I think that has to change like the, where the eyeballs are, it's obviously, you know, you're going to lose people because the reason they say they don't put more women's sports in the highlights, like, well, our audience is just men. They don't want to see this. Well, we have to make them see this. Otherwise, how are they ever going to change their minds about what female athletes can be? If you don't see it, um, you can't be it, but also how can you, you know, believe that they're, they are capable and they are amazing athletes in their own right. So I think it's going to, it's going to take generational change for sure. But teaching, you know, not only putting women's sports in the eyes of women and just changing that narrative. And also for uh, there's an amazing uh, woman, uh, a woman in sport named uh, Nikki Nora. She's a uh, she works with like influencer partnerships and different things. So I'm shouting her out because she came up with uh, this line that I'm going to share. But she had this idea where she was saying it doesn't make sense for you know, a male sports fan to just say a women's sports is horrible, like who watches, blah, blah, blah. If you're an actual sports fan, why wouldn't you not support women in sport too? You can say that NBA is better if you want to and say, oh, I just prefer the NBA. But mm -hmm. what does that have to do with saying that um, you would never watch women's sports? It's not good. And in the hockey world, she made a reference, which I thought was amazing, which is um, a casual hockey fan will go to their local rink and watch a junior C men's hockey game, which is like a low level, but like competitive uh, level game. But then they say women, uh, pro women's hockey sucks. And I'm like, you will go to the local rink and see these guys who are below that level play, but you're going to say like the pro women aren't good. It just doesn't make sense. So I think it's just generation generationally, we just have to change like that mindset. And, um, you know, I, for sure, if in the future I have a son, I'm going to show him amazing women athletes and like not have him say, Oh, that girl, that girl is good for a girl. It's like, no, that athlete is inspiring. I want to be like her the mm -hmm. same way that they want to be like Tom Brady or whoever else. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Natalie. Yeah. Yeah. So before I, before I let you go, I have to run you through the two minute drill. I, I run everybody through it. Like I told you, I really enjoyed this conversation. This was, this was, this, this is up there. Natalie, this is up there. You know, I'm not going to say Appreciate one is better it. than the other, but <laughs> Just know you're up there, okay? All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want you to know that that you're that you're definitely, you're definitely up there. But uh, so okay, so how two minute drill works is I'm just gonna I'm gonna hit you with some rapid fire questions, and all ultimately, right. uh, you know, I'm I, I put it out there, just just have a little bit of fun on the platform, and then from there we we wrap it up, we put a bow and a ribbon on it, and then let people know where to find you, and then we call it a day. So are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, and here we go. Favorite food? Pizza. What kind of pizza? Oh, wood-fired pizza. Like I'm a big like wood-fired, not super thin crust, but like kind of. And okay. uh, I like, I'll just get a margarita, but if I get like a normal pizza, I like Hawaiian. I'm, I'm team pineapple on pizza. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. The last book you read? Oh, what is the last book I read? Uh, you know what? I got that book and I just totally forgot the author, Happy Sexy Millionaire. Is it, is it Stephen? Um, he partnered up with the with uh, Jack Butcher, who does Visualize Value. I don't know if anyone anyone knows him, but he kind of got Twitter famous and he makes these amazing graphics of like quotes, but he like visualizes them. And he did all the visuals in this book. So I just bought it. It just came in and I just started reading it, but I haven't finished it yet. Gotcha, gotcha. What's your favorite go-to show to stream? Oh, that's a hard one because I'm not a rewatcher. Like I gotta watch uh, something different. Oh, but my boyfriend is. He will rewatch Friends over and over again, or The Office. And I'm like, oh, I can't watch. Like I love those shows, but I can't watch it for like the sixth time. Um, yeah, but those are good. I, I mean, The Office is probably the show I've watched the most times. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll say The Office. But there's some new ones that I'm. Tr I mean, I'm really waiting for new ones because there's not much new during this pandemic. I think we've all run out of shows at this point. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Favorite favorite podcast. Uh, School of Greatness by Lewis Howes. Mm, mm, okay, okay. And one one tip that you want to give to a student athlete? T take the time to figure yourself out. I think, you know, who I am at 27 is different than who I was when I was in the student athlete ages. Um, so, you know, don't box, box yourself in. Like, your, your options are unlimited. And um, just know that if you pick a career, pick a sport, whatever it is, you're not stuck there. 
there is still time to change. When you're, I think, when you're in your young 20s, you think that whatever you choose dictates the rest of your life. And, you know, of course, it does impact it. But just know you can change no matter what age you're at. Excellent. Excellent. This is just a bonus question. Who, who's one individual that you would like to see me interview next on Beyond the Ball? Ooh, you should have Serena Williams. <laughs> oh, I'll reach out. I'll reach out. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll definitely reach out. Nat, Natalie, let, let people know where they can find you. Let them know booking information. You know, you can do all that now at this time. Awesome. Yeah, you can just head to my website, uh, natalieallport.com. I think pretty much all my links are there, my podcast uh, information, email, all that good stuff. And uh, you can go to my Instagram, uh, which is also Natalie Allport and TikTok. All that stuff is the same, just my name. So that's that's pretty much I just caught up that domain name, caught up the username on all the platforms. So you'll find me under that. Excellent. 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 Well, Natalie, thank you so much for hanging out with us here, hanging out with the ballers, uh, just just being inspiring, being, being a, a dope athlete and just inspiring us all across the board, because uh, I wish I could snowboard. I haven't tried, <laughs> but, you know, you can, you you can, learn. Every, time, every time I see your videos, I'm telling you, I'm like, God, I need to work out somewhere. <laughs> I need to do a pull up or something. I don't know. So thank you. So th thank you for, for what, what you do all across the board. And uh, thank you for, for taking the time to be a guest. Hey, likewise. And really appreciate you having me on. Certainly, certainly. So all the ballers out there, all the ballers out there, uh, just want to really encourage you all definitely connect with Natalie on all platforms. Because uh, I, I mean, I've heard her speak numerous times on, on Clubhouse and her podcast and and I, I, I love her content on, on, on Instagram. So be sure to connect with her, uh, reach out to her, let her know what part you really enjoyed about this episode. And then also, I want to just encourage you all to, to be sure to, to subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy what you heard today. And then also share with one, two, three, four, however many friends that you feel could benefit from the message that you heard today. Be sure to do that. And once again, I'm Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree. Thank you.